Hello, welcome to the Comic Book Commentary. I'm Bo Leidig, and this week we're going to be diving back into the world of the early days of Wildstorm Comics with Wetworks number three. So let's zoom in and take a closer look. First published in September of 1993, we see here on the cover that the Wetworks logo is actually not front and center. It's off in the top right hand corner. And it has the subtitle down here of Grail Transformed, as we see Grail featured front and center in the middle of the cover, now glowing blue, carrying a couple of sticks that are also glowing blue and seem to have some energy trailing off. Uh, this cover is pretty cool, not entirely indicative of what goes on inside of this book, but still not completely off either. And We'll see what I'm talking about when we get inside. Willis Portasio, Plot and Pencils. Brandon Choi, Dialogue. Scott Williams, Inks. Joe Chiodo, Colors. Richard Starkings and Comicraft, Letters. The story of issue number three starts out in Washington, D.C. at the I.O. Command Center, where we see our old pal Miles Craven, along with a lot of other high-ranking military officials, sitting in front of a wall of video screens that are all depicting the current members of Team 7. Uh, of course, Team 7 has had multiple iterations throughout the years. Uh, if you'd like to know more about Team 7, check out my Team 7 playlist. That gives you more backstory into the earlier days of Team 7. Also, where uh, Dane, who is the current commander of Team 7, uh, started out as he was a former member of the team back in the 70s. Um, and the president seems to be very upset about why Team 7 has not returned from their mission to Transylvania. Of course, we know that this is because they have uh, all been bonded with strange gold symbiotes that have increased their strength and durability and given them all sorts of new abilities that they didn't believe were even possible. And that also they encountered their first battle with the Night Tribes who want to do their own stuff in terms of taking over the human world and also getting the symbiotes back. That's a whole mess of a plot that's going on right there. Uh, some of the military officials believe that Team 7 should be given the benefit of the doubt. However, of course, Miles Craven wants to throw them under the bus and states that he believes they've been compromised and may have even been working as double agents with the Night Tribes. Uh, the president seems to want to err on the side of caution as he tells Miles to take whatever need, or means he needs to take to rectify the situation. Uh, Craven tells the president that he wants to set free one of his higher rank. Well, I got higher ranking is not the word, but one of his best operatives, a man by the name of Lagouche, I believe is how you say it. Of course, he is currently locked up in Leavenworth. And the other men in the room seem to be really baffled that Miles would even suggest releasing him as he is referred to as a butcher and bloodthirsty. But the president gives Miles the okay and Craven says that he's going to use this man to take care of the situation. Now, despite the introduction of this potential new adversary and the new plot point of Craven going after Team 7 with the blessings of the president... That's the last we're going to hear about any of that for this issue, because now we're being teleported over to Madison Square Garden, where we saw in the last issue the Night Tribe of Thome, I believe is how you say it, or maybe it is Tome. It's not exactly giving a pronunciation key on how you're supposed to say that, led by one Prince Drakan, who their plan is to unleash a bioweapon that will infect everyone at the concert and then by proxy infect the rest of New York City and essentially kill the entire inhabitants of NYC uh, as they sneak it into the concert that is being put on by one Johnny Savoy and the Living Dead, who we now find out Johnny is actually the stepbrother of the Blood Queen. And the reason that they want to kill him is because he's a potential successor to the Blood Queen if they manage to kill her. And they want to make sure that their leader, Prince Drakan, is the next in line for the throne. However, there's a few plot holes in this. Um, number one, if if they were able to kill the Blood Queen, it seems that they'd also just have been able to kill Savoy if he takes over the role. Also, 
vampires kind of need humans because of the fact that they feed off of them. Uh, it is mentioned here that they blame the humans for the ecological state of things in terms of um, believing that they're killing the planet and whatnot. And that's understandable. However, again, they rely on humans as a food source. And depending what vampire lore you're reading, vampires won't die if they don't feed, but they will potentially go insane or potentially also wither and fall into a comatose state where their bodies become almost like statues and they're just trapped that way until somebody else feeds them. So despite the fact that they seem to have a real bone to pick with all of humanity, they also rely on all of humanity to, you know, keep them fed and prevent these terrible outcomes for themselves. In another part of the city, we see that the team is dashing towards Madison Square Garden in a jet provided to them by none other than Waring, who we saw in the last issue, along with Mother One, gave the team the intel about this bioweapon being deployed by the Night Tribes and that they needed to stop this to prevent this calamity from taking place and millions of people from being killed. Uh, we see that Dane is kind of thinking to himself with an inner monologue, uh, very impressed with the hardware that his team was given by Warren, um, and also happy with the fact that his team is so well trained that they don't even need to speak to each other. Everybody knows their job. Everybody knows where they need to be. And even though this should be some sort of like, you know, just a walk in the park for them, given their training and the fact that they now have these new symbiotes and all this weaponry, Dane has a really terrible feeling that something very bad is going to go down and that some of the lives of his team may be in danger. Meanwhile, back inside of Madison Square Garden, after the bioweapon has been unloaded from the truck and brought inside, of course, it's disguised as a giant crowd beach ball. One of the concert goers in the rear of the crowd turns around and notices it and thinks that it's some kind of giant beach ball with cameras on it and he wants to get on the big screen. He's told to buzz off by one of the vampires uh, leading the way and watching over the mission. While one of the other vampires proceeds to try and make sure that all the preparations are made and the detonator on the device is set. Uh, the man at the back of the crowd, though, seems to still not be getting the message as he tries to get closer until finally the vampire that was blocking his path grabs him and essentially tells him that he's going to kill him because he's, you know, getting in the way. Also, we see the vampire still wearing these weird, I don't even want to call them glasses or goggles. I don't know what they are, but it all of them are wearing them. They all have one on. I don't know what it is, what it does, what it's for. They've all got one. And right as his, he that as this vampire is about to kill the concert goer, he is suddenly struck in the head with a shot from above as one of the other vampires takes multiple shots to the chest. We see that they are being watched through a crosshair along with the guy who the vampire had a hold of who is now freaking out, understandably. And we get a transmission from none other than Pilgrim as she states that one of the bogeys is down. However, she managed to miss the shot on the other one, which has her very upset as this is the first ever kill shot she's ever missed in her career. Dane also believes that something is awry as Pilgrim never misses and worries that there might be something else going on that would have caused her to miss as we see her hanging from the rafters of Madison Square Garden, uh, holding her gun, which is apparently a belt-fed precision sniper rifle, which doesn't make any sense, but whatever, it's fine. Uh, she's then scolded by Mother One, who says that she should have taken up the follow-up shots despite the crowd being in the way. Uh, however, Pilgrim argues that sh she's not going to put the lives of innocent bystanders at risk, and Dane agrees that that's the wrong move and believes that they should be doing their best to protect the concert goers. However, Mother One states that every war has casualties and that it's more important for them to prevent the bioweapon from being detonated at any cost. However, Dane still disagrees with her take on that as he tells her he's going to jump into the fray and provide backup with his team who has now lost the element of surprise. Uh, Mother One states that, you know, she's fine with this as he leaps down. And we see that Dane is now beginning to question how much they can trust Mother One as he doesn't believe it's necessarily the best thing that she holds civilian casualties as, you know, something that they don't need to worry about. 
Uh, we also then see the crowd gathering around the dead vampire who had his head blown off, all wondering what's going on. Their leader, now realizing that their cover has been blown, tells all of the rest of the vampires in the Night Tribe to proceed with the mission and to attack as we see a horde of them lunge forward and try to capture Savoy, who they plan on killing. However, their leader wants the kill shot himself, so they're supposed to take him alive. This is easier said than done, however, as Savoy is no slouch himself and instantly pulls out his claws and just starts shredding the vampires as they lunge toward him and also tells them, you know, you guys are all signing your own death warrants here. I'm not going to stand for this. You know, the fact that you're trying to start a war while I'm on stage is unacceptable. And just really letting him know that he's super pissed off and that this is not going to fly. Eventually, the minions of House Tom are able to overpower Savoy and take him hostage as they hold him in place for their leader, who is none other than Draxus, who is the brother of Prince Trakan, approaches and tells Savoy that this is the end for him. Savoy tries to remain defiant, stating that when the Blood Queen finds out about this, heads are going to roll. However, Draxus cuts him off and states that by the time the Blood Queen finds out about this, Savoy will be dead and the bioweapon will have been detonated and that all of the plans will be in motion so that Prince Trakan can take her throne. And just as he's about to move in for the final blow, he is hit with a hail of bullets from none other than Mendoza, who repels in from the ceiling, just completely lighting him up. Uh, this, of course, throws a wrench in the plans for everyone as Mendoza continues to unload bullets on all the vampires on stage, uh, stating that he's pretty psyched to be able to save uh, one of his favorite musicians, Johnny Savoy. However, we do get some chatter back from Dane, who tells him that he can get an autograph on his own time. Uh, Savoy then turns around and thanks Mendoza for the assist as he plunges his claws through the chest of one of the vampire minions. It's at this point that Mendoza realizes that Savoy is also a vampire and is pretty shocked by the whole thing. And Savoy tells him, you know, hey man, we're on the same side, and I'm also someone who remembers to pay his debts, as he basically lets Mendoza know, like, hey man, I appreciate the assist, and, you know, I owe you one. Uh, Mendoza, though he's a little bit sketchy at first about teaming up with a vampire, realizes that Savoy is right, and that the two of them need to work together to get through this, and also that he's a huge fan of Savoy, so why not work with someone that he's, you know kind of in awe of the celebrity of. Meanwhile, Savoy's backup singer is in the clutches of another vampire who is about to sink his teeth into her neck and finish her off. When he is caught from behind by a huge right hook from none other than Jester, who states that he needs to back off, uh, the vampire, of course, is only momentarily stunned by this attack and states that the girl was just an appetizer and that Jester is going to be the main course. Jester, of course, is not at all wavering from the words of this vampire as he states that the vampire can bring it and is like, oh, wow, you know, I'm really worried about your huge claws and teeth. And the vampire states that, you know, this is all to eviscerate Jester with. And Jester, Jester tells him to you know, go ahead and bring it while Savoy's backup singer looks on. And as the vampire lunges forward, Jester just pulls out a gun and blasts his head straight off of his body. Uh, the backup singer says, excellent job, human, which makes Jester realize that she also is a vampire and is quite worried about the fact that, you know, he may have to deal with her. However, she, as Savoy states, that they're on the same side and that the two of them need to work together if they're all going to survive this encounter. Meanwhile, back in the crowd near the bioweapon, we see that Regine Velasquez and her cameraman Dave have come across the two bodies of the vampires that were shot by Pilgrim and are trying to figure out exactly what they're looking at as they don't understand that these are, you know, the living dead that they're laying eyes on. Uh, she tells Dave to continue to film, as Dave seems worried that they're as close as they are to what appear to him to be monsters. As they see light start pouring out of the vampire that got its head blown off, 
They can't believe what this is that's going on in front of them as the body suddenly disappears. Uh, Velasquez asks Dave if, you know, he got all that on film. He confirms that he did. They then notice that the vampire shot through the chest, gets back to his feet, and flies across the arena. Again, they can't believe what they're seeing, but Dave says that, you know, he's getting it all on tape. He can see every bit of it and that they're going to have one heck of a story to deliver when they get back to the newsroom. And Velasquez believes that this is their ticket to primetime major network stuff. Meanwhile, in another part of the arena, we see that Claymore is dealing with a lot of vampires all closing in for the kill and is also concerned about the fact that these vampires are somehow able, able to nullify the symbiote as we see that one of them digs their claws into it and pulls it up. He's immediate, or he's requesting immediate backup, stating that, you know, the vampires are about to come in for the kill. And Mother One seems a little bit hesitant to give him any backup, stating that, you know, everyone else is kind of busy at the moment and that he'll have to handle this on his own. He states that this is not, that that's not going to be possible and that he's being overrun. And just as things look as if they're not going to go his way, none other than Dane shows up, shoves his wrist cannon directly into the mouth of the vampire that was about to kill Claymore and blasts his head clean off. Claymore wisely gets out of the way of the blast radius and ducks underneath the hail of fire that is given by Dane into the other vampires. And then thanks his commander, uh, Dane asks what happened and Claymore gives him the rundown about how, for whatever reason, it seemed to be that when a number of the vampires all cornered him, they seemed to be able to just rip the symbiote clean off of him with no resistance whatsoever. And Dane realizes that this is the exact same thing that happened to him in his dream at the end of issue number two. Uh, also, if you haven't watched my videos on issues number one and two, you probably should. Otherwise, nothing that's going on in this issue is going to make any sense to you. In yet another part of the arena, we catch up with Grail, who is under the impression that he needs to go and help Claymore. However, Mother One tells him that Dane has it under control and also orders him to proceed to the bioweapon so that they can secure it. Uh, however, Grail states that, you know, he's not engaged with anyone. He can help some, some of his teammates in other places. And then Mother One tells him that he is, in fact, engaged and that there's a vampire right behind him. However, Grail isn't able to get around fast enough as he takes a shot to the face, which rips his mask clean off. Uh, he wears this mask because Grail is incredibly vain and doesn't want anything to happen to his face as he is a bit of a ladies' man and believes that his good looks are super important to maintain such a status. He then becomes very enraged by the attack that was made on his face by said vampire and this is where we see his hands start to glow with some sort of blue energy and light. And this energy also affects the sticks that he's carrying as well. Uh, we find out through Dane's monologue that Grail is an expert in nearly every form of hand-to-hand -hand combat and is basically a living weapon. Uh, this is evident by the fact that Grail begins to just lay into this vampire and just completely go off as we see him crack the vampire across the head with one of his sticks then hit him with an uppercut, and then plunge the stick directly into his heart as we see the vampire fall down dead. And then Grail suddenly realizes what happened and is very shocked when he looks at his hands and his sticks and then questions what in the world is going on as, you know, none of this was a conscious action by him and he can't believe what he's seeing and what he's doing and is really starting to wonder what exactly these symbiotes are capable of now. Meanwhile, back at the bioweapon, we see that Flattop and Crossbones are doing their best to defend it against the horde of vampires who are trying to activate the detonator. Uh, they're requesting backup from Mother One, who states that there is no backup available, that everyone else on the team is preoccupied fighting vampires on their own. Uh, she tells the two to hold out. However, Flattop responds that that's not going to happen. He's down to his last ammo belt and that Crossbones is injured and that they're in a world of trouble right now as we see Flattop fire off his last round and the vampires who are bum-rushing them realize they've got their opening. 
they lunge forward and start to tear into flat top and cross or crossbones. Uh, Mother One tells them to use their symbiotes to fight back. However, they don't seem able to do this as we see the two of them taking attack after attack. And once again, just as we saw with Claymore, the symbiote slowly melts away from Flat Top's body as the vampire states that they fought valiantly and as a reward they will have a swift death as he unleashes his claws and then plunges them into Flat Top's neck. We then see the arm bracelets that Mother One is wearing all have vital monitors on them for each member of the team and that Flat Top and Crossbones vitals go completely still with the, you know, categorical beep of like, oh, they're dead now. They have no hearts or no heartbeat anymore. And Mother One doesn't even seem really that upset about the fact that those men are now dead. Uh, she's actually more concerned about the fact that she's learned that the symbiotes can be overrun by mass attack and that also the symbiotes were somehow peeled away from the men by what she believes is some sort of a telepathic attack that may be instituted by the vampires who, you know, were engaging the two men or possibly by their leader, Draxus, who may be using them as a conduit for his own psychic abilities. Draxus is happy that his minions have finally drawn blood on their adversaries as he rejoins them and then also wonders exactly how the team is so organized and how they all seem to be you know, holding their own and being one step ahead of the vampires. And then he realizes that it's because they obviously have someone acting as an eye in the sky providing recon. And he looks up and spots Mother One alone in the rafters. He orders the other vampires to take her out. Uh, she continues to look down upon the scene, giving directions to the rest of the team, but is very aware of the vampires that are breaching her perimeter and approaching her from behind. She begins to activate a self-defense sequence. Uh, Dane also worried about her as he sees the vampires moving towards her position, asks if she needs backup. She states no that she wants to that, or she wants Dane to maintain the objective with the rest of the team as we see the little bits of energy appearing around her shoulders, which are in fact a laser grid that starts to just slice all of the approaching vampires into tiny pieces and blood gushes everywhere. Uh, Dane once again asks if she's sure she doesn't need any help. She states that she has the situation completely under control, which she does as all of the ensuing chaos has brought death to every single vampire that got within a meter of her. And she then tells Dane that, you know, she wants him to keep with the plan, get everybody together and move in on the bioweapons so that they can get it out of the arena. This is all being watched by another, none other than Pilgrim, as she's actually pretty impressed, stating that she thinks that, you know, Mother One is a real ice queen, and, you know, despite the fact that she thought, you know, she was actually pretty cold, she really can't believe how easily Mother One just sliced up all those vampires and didn't even break a sweat or bat an eyelash or even turn around for that matter. However, because of the distraction of watching this, Pilgrim has failed to realize that there was a vampire sneaking up on her as it drops down and grabs her by the throat. At this point, Pilgrim realizes that she's made a grave mistake and that this vampire is more than capable of ending her life and for the first time in nearly her entire life feels genuinely afraid as the vampire states that this is the end for her and that he will, you know, genuinely, you know, take pleasure in ending her life, but also offers her a uh, chance to become one of them as he believes she's very beautiful and would like to uh, have her as someone that, you know, he and the rest of the other vampires could have a little bit of fun with. She, of course, rejects this and tells him to go screw off and remains defiant even though she believes that this is the end of her life. As we see Pilgrim's symbiote start to peel back from her face and the vampire open its mouth, we suddenly see that there is the sound of a stab or slice. Uh, we then see Pilgrim ask, you know, or Colonel, is that you? However, as the vampire falls, she sees that there is another vampire who has actually come to her aid. She's coughing and surprised to not see Dane as the one who saved her. 
Uh, the vampire that did save her says, you know, I was just lending a hand. You know, you don't need to worry about me as he transforms into a more human-like form and starts to make his exit. He says, we'll meet again, Agent Martiza. Martiza being Pilgrim's actual last name. She's surprised that this man knows her name and says, you know, what's your name? Uh, he says that my friends call me Wilder, but... This doesn't sit well with Pilgrim as she's very confused as to who this man was and how he knew who she was. Meanwhile, back at the site of the bioweapon, Dane has finally made it there and calls in for their aircraft to come in so that it can airlift this thing out of the arena. However, he's so preoccupied that he doesn't realize that Draxus is right behind him as Draxus unleashes an attack on, Z on Dane using his psychic ability to subdue Dane and also his symbiote, and also then uses his psychic abilities to start peeling back the symbiote and give him the chance to kill Dane. Dane can't even move at this point. His symbiote's completely overwhelmed, and he realizes that the same thing that happened to him in his dream seems to be happening to him right now. Faced with the realization that if he fails here, not only will his team perish, but also millions of innocent New Yorkers will die as well, Dane gathers all of his resolve and actually manages to re-solidify his symbiote and reverse the psionic attack that was levied against him by Draxus. As we see Dane grit his teeth, he unleashes all of his fury and then realizes that he doesn't have control over this and that he's just unleashing a completely unstoppable attack on Draxus, who, by the way, cannot believe what's happening as he starts to crumple to the ground. Draxus then wonders if Dane is in fact the one that the Blood Queen spoke of as he lets out a scream in agony and pain and falls down dead. Later on, Dane is joined by none other than Mother One and Grail, who look at the fallen Draxus in awe. Uh, Mother One informs Dane that Claymore and Jester have the package in their possession and are preparing it for evac. Uh, Dane seems to be happy that they were able to stop the bomb from being detonated. However, this is when Mother One informs Dane that it came at a cost as Jester, or I'm sorry, not Jester, Crossbones and Flattop both perished during the mission and that you know, the Night Tribe took their bodies as some sort of a trophy, she believes, as Pilgrim and Dozer weren't able to, you know, recover the bodies in time before the vampires took them. This enrages Dane as he states that, you know, he didn't want to lose any of his people on this mission and that if the Night Tribe wants a fight, he's out for revenge at this point. However, Mother One doesn't really like this course of action, and Grail seems, seems to agree a little bit, stating, you know, Commander, this could have been a lot worse. However, this isn't something that Dane is willing to drop, as he believes that at this point it's personal, and that he wants to take the fight directly to the Night Tribes. Later on in the news van outside of Madison Square Garden, as we see Regine and Dave watching the tape of all the footage that they got, they're stunned at the fact that while they can see blood and people reacting, they can't actually see the vampires. They are like, where are the monsters? And this, of course, is because they, A, don't realize they're dealing with vampires, and B, vampires can't be filmed the same way they don't have reflections, at least depending on certain vampire lores that you may or may not go by. Uh, this is shocking to the two of them, as they're not really sure what to make of this, when suddenly a man gets into the van behind them and yanks the tape directly out of Regine's hands. She states, you know, what are you doing? Give that back. You can't do this. And asks who he is. He states that his name isn't important and that he works for a very high-level government operative. And that is what gives them the authority to take the tape. Regine continues to persist in her protest. However, the man states that she'd be better off, you know, giving up on this one before, you know, he's uh, forced to use his authority to unleash large caliber weapons in the vicinity. Uh, Dave understandably realizes the kind of threat that that is and tells Regine to basically give it a rest and let the men go. This isn't a fight they can win. And as they walk away, the man says, you know, you'd be smart to listen to your friend there so that you can live to see another day. Meanwhile, at his base, Drakan realizes that he's lost and also sees the footage of 
his now dead brother, uh, he states that, you know, at this point, it's personal. He's going after Dane and the rest of the team and that they're going to pay for this with their lives, screaming, do you hear me? However, he's also being watched by the Blood Queen, who apparently has some camera inside of his base, which I find funny. Uh, she is back in New Orleans stating that, you know, everything worked out splendidly according to her plan and then asks if her cousin now believes her that Dane is in fact something special. Her cousin states that, you know, this might be the case, but she's still worried about Drakan and the threat that he poses to the Blood Queen's reign. However, she believes that she's got everything under control and that the future will work out in her favor as we see that this is, in fact, the end of the story. We then see an advertisement for Wildcat Adventures, which is a separate Wildcats comic book line that was based on the animated series. So it plays along with all of the story points of the animated series and exists, I guess, outside of the main ongoing series, I believe. I don't know. I have a few issues of Wildcats Adventures, but I haven't read them. So I don't think that that series ran for more than a year or two. And we'll get into videos about that in the future. And we then make it to the letter section, which is now called The Pool. Um, this, of course, is just like every other image letter section where people get to write in and ask questions based on the comic book that they've just read. Uh, however, strangely enough, these letters are being answered by one uh, Francis Takanaga instead of Willis Portacio, probably because Portacio was preoccupied with getting this book out. And also the fact that he was, you know, still coming off of dealing with the tragic loss of his sister. And that was the whole reason why the Wetworks book was delayed for so long in the first place, well over a year, uh, just because he had to take time away to, you know, help his family through the tragic loss of someone that they loved. As the letter section continues, most of it is the standard fare of just talking about how great they think the comic book is and how much they love the artwork. Uh, many people offering their condolences to Portacio for the loss of his sister. Um, but generally nothing special except for one letter, which is very critical, uh, basically bringing up the same criticisms that I brought up earlier in this series, that, you know, all of the characters have a very similar visual look and due to the way that it's written, none of them really have a chance to allow their personalities to shine all that much. So it becomes very confusing throughout the meat of the comic book to keep up with one character versus another character and, you know, keep track of which one is doing what, uh, which I can say is still the problem even with this issue. Uh, going through this, I kept having to remind myself multiple times which character I was talking about on which page and what they were doing uh, simply because, you know, at this point, they're all mostly the same except for, you know, what we saw with Grail in this issue where he gained a new ability. Of course, as I stated before, this is something that does get rectified the further into the series we go. But at this point, this criticism is very valid, and I understand exactly why that guy wrote this letter. We then get a two-page vertical spread ad for Backlash number three featuring the Savage Dragon. Now, at this point, at the time I'm recording this video, I have not made any videos on any issues of Backlash. Now, I do own the entire series, I'm just waiting until I get to the point in Stormwatch where Backlash splinters off into his own solo series before I start making videos on that. So keep your eyes peeled because it is coming in the future. And on the final page of the book, we get an advertisement for Wildcats trading cards. I've never seen any, and if I did, I wouldn't get them for a couple of reasons. Number one, they're oversized at two and a half inches by four and a half inches. So guess what? They don't fit into any standard size trading card sleeve. And number two... They're all chromium. I don't know if you've ever seen chromium trading cards before, but they don't look great. Uh, the chromium really just kind of prevents any kind of high level of detail from being achieved on something the size of a trading card. So it really just overall isn't that visually attractive to me. Um, you know, despite the fact that I do like the trading cards from the early and mid 90s, this isn't something I'm interested in finding. And on the reverse inside cover, we get another advertisement for Blackthorn, which, again, I've never played this. I've never met anyone who played this. If you have, feel free to talk about it in the comments below. I'd like to know what this game was about and if it was any good. 
And that was Wetworks number three. Overall, I thought it was a pretty good conclusion to the initial introduction of this story. Um, it is stated in the letter section that, you know, this is basically serving the purpose of a mini series without being a mini series, as the ongoing series will continue on with issue number four, which I like. That's easier to keep track of than the way they were doing it before, where it's you know, a one through three or a one through four mini series, and then starting the series back over at either zero or one, that's kind of a pain to uh, deal with in terms of keeping track of everything. This is a better idea. And I think the story did a pretty good job of establishing the characters in terms of, you know, here's our protagonist, here's our antagonist. Uh, we have a villain that's, you know, set up for them to deal with. We also have some behind the scenes things going on with Craven that the team doesn't know about to keep the ideas fresh and to keep them having to deal with multiple adversaries. We also don't know exactly where the blood or the blood queen falls in all of this in terms of whether or not she's going to help the team or try to kill them. So, you know, there's a lot um that's been put into the foundation and I think overall it works. Uh, but then again, these are just my opinions. You might have thought that these first three issues did a terrible job of establishing the story and that, you know, nothing about this seems cool or interesting to you. But if so, that's okay because everyone's entitled to their own opinions. If you enjoyed today's video, please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. And thanks for stopping by. Have a great day.